Tracy Repchuk here. Good day, my friends. I'm the host of Reach Millions TV, an entrepreneurial lifestyle and learning channel where I will educate and introduce you to some of the greatest powerhouses in their field. As an entrepreneur for over 37 years, I've had the good fortune to appear in Forbes over 27 times, speak in 39 countries, appeared on NBC, ABC, CBS, Fox, won awards from the Senate, the Assembly, the White House, and President Obama, written nine number one international best-selling best books, and I am really here to help you with that journey when I reached millions with my message and show you how with specialized trainings and then introduce you to the people that can help you find more leads, make more sales, and reach millions with your message. You can find out more about me at tracyrapchuk.com or reachmillionsacademy.com. Now, today I am joined by the world champion speaker, Lance Miller. Lance is an award-winning speaker and the Toastmasters 2005 world champion of public speaking. Yes, right on. He's a trainer delivering over 5,000 speeches across 60 countries. His bio is so deep. I'm actually going to go into it with questions so I can fit him into the show. So Lance, welcome. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. Now we have to start with what you're best known for, and then we're gonna dive deep into some other fascinating things that you have done. You are a world champion speaker. I have actually studied that. It is not an easy task. So when did you start speaking and describe what it took to become a world champion? Well, to understand, for the audience to understand this, this is a competition that Toastmasters International runs every year. And it starts at the club level. It goes up six levels, single elimination. So it starts with somewhere around 30, 35,000 people in the world and 126 countries. And you wind up with the top 10 speakers at the end of the six month run on this on the stage at the Toastmasters convention. And they speak and there's one winner and you're crowned the world champion of public speaking. I started competing in 1993. I won in 2005. And it was an incredible journey of self-discovery of really figuring out what my messages were, what I meant, what I stood for in my life. It was really more of a journey of self-discovery and realization it was about speaking because in order to be a great speaker, I had to be authentic. And that was something I watch a lot of people struggle with is really finding their authenticity. But once I actually got that, it was like my messages aligned and everything. And I would, I would really say, and ask me, ask me something if I'm off track here, but one of the biggest things I learned through this process was how to lose and how to stand back up and come back the next year because I lost for 12 years. I was competing in this thing and quite honestly for nine years, I had one of the best clubs in the world in Toastmasters. It took me nine years to win at the club, which is the first level and then it's going up and you know, and, and you think you're great, you think you're fantastic, and then you don't even win, you don't even place. And I always say, it's one thing to compete and lose that emotional drop. It's another thing to compete, think you won and lose from that drop. And that one was so painful. I learned not to, not to jump ahead, just take, take the punches, figure out what did that person do that I didn't do? How do I need to better myself? And I've applied that across the area, other areas of my life through that journey to being a world champion speaker. So I don't know if I answered your question, but that's what I was. <laughs> you absolutely did answer the question. And, and I, I recall when I took a look into that, I was like, holy mackerel, that is stiff competition. And I watched the various rounds and what you had to do. It was phenomenal. And, and share actually with the listeners what your topic was. Well, early on, a lady named Roberta Perry, who's one of the founders of our club, when I first joined Toastmasters, I asked her what was the international speech competition. And she said, that's like you had five to seven minutes to speak to the world. And that sort of became the bar I was trying to cross. And one of the reasons I had such a challenge with it was I was trying to figure out if I had five to seven minutes to speak to the world, what would that message be? And my first message was pick somebody else. <laughs> and <laughs> And as I went through it, but really a, a number of things I experienced through building some of the, one of the top clubs in Toastmasters through the businesses I built was really the importance of, of finding what's right in people and acknowledging and validating what's right in people versus pointing out what's wrong and with them. And that's really what the message of my speech was. 
and I had the title do the ultimate question. And the ultimate question is, do you validate? And there was a double entendre on do you, I was using a parking ticket, like getting my parking validated, but I flipped that over and do you validate other people for what's right in them? And um, it was very, it was in a very effective message. And I, to, to this day, there's not a week that goes by that I don't get a couple of emails from people saying they just saw my speech on YouTube. And, and I have people say they watch it once a week because they just need to get pumped up again. And that's, that's the best feedback, the best pay I could ever have. Uh, agreed. And I watched it as well. It was fantastic for those of you listening. Definitely go and check that out on oh, YouTube. You. Yes, make it part of your uh, inspirational um, uh, kind of library. So we'll take a look at this next thing that I, I loved about you. And I actually didn't know. And that is you're an international adventurer. So you should directly, uh, definitely uh, connect with one of my other interviews that I did with Werner Berger. He holds the Guinness World Book of uh, Records for summiting the largest peaks in all seven uh, continents, including Everest. And still at 85 years old, he's going to be returning to Kilimanjaro next year. Um, and so, yeah, and he's looking for partners if you're up for a climb. <laughs> now, it says here, and this is what made me think of you, that you have summited 14,000 foot peaks. You've done rafting whitewater across the U.S. You've sailed the transatlantic from the Virgin Islands to Norway. You are a private pilot. You've done scuba diving under the ice of frozen lakes and twice hitchhiked through Europe. So were you always an adventurer, even from a young age? And what is your biggest adventure goal now when it comes to kind of, you know, what's next for you? Well, you know, it was interesting. I grew up in this little town in Indiana. It was sort of flat and farmland, but I was outside a lot. And yes, I always had a great desire to go explore and do things. And I was active in Boy Scouts. And so I was camping and I, we had a, I, my summers, my uh, family had a, a farm and a, a summer home in Michigan. And so I was up there with my grandparents. We were canoeing and sailing. And so I was always out outside, very active. And then when I was 14, I talked my parents into, and this was, it was my initiative to sending me to a mountaineering and leadership school in Telluride, Colorado for the summer. Mm -hmm. And my whole goal was to be able to be, you know, dumped in the middle of the woods, you know, like Rambo with, you know, nothing only about a loin cough and a buoy knife and survive. And I didn't learn that there, but I did learn a lot of stuff. But really, Tracy, a lot of the adventure things I was pushing myself for on a young age, I did have a lot of interest. There was a lot of flying in my family. I wanted to fly. There was a lot of sailing in my family. I wanted to sail. And I grew up with that. And I had a huge love for that. But a lot of the stuff was pushing myself out beyond my own personal barrier, my own envelope. I wanted, I, I didn't want there to be something that I said, I haven't, I'm afraid to do that. I don't know how to do that. I don't know if I wanted to push through it and go, I've experienced that. And by the time I was in my mid twenties, I had done significant amount of stuff. I haven't climbed all the top, top the highest peaks on every continent, but I'd done enough for me personally. And what happened was as I'd moved out here to LA and I was sailing to Catalina like every three weeks and doing three or four dives, we, you know, at every weekend. And all of a sudden I go, what's the purpose behind what I'm doing? I had the purpose for adventure and it was to expand my, it was really to push myself, develop myself, discover who I was through those adventures. And then it became a fact that I'm diving in the same places. I sail to the same places. There's no challenge in this right now. And that's when I started to basically, and I felt confident. I didn't feel like, oh, there's not something I can't, there's something I can't do. I have to, no, I can do that. Not a problem. Been there, done that. Okay, now let's move on. So I really just started to look at expanding my world in other ways. But what was interesting was in, in 1998, I was recruited because of that background uh, and, uh, th and a couple other backgrounds I had. I'd, I'd been a national spokesperson for tax reform and I debated things. I had like PR training and I was a proven executive. I was, I was re uh, recruited by the International Foundation for Human Rights and Tolerance to lead that year, which was a 2000 mile marathon in, for human rights through eight countries in Europe. And we ran every step of the way for six weeks. And, and I'd hit twice hitchhiked across Europe. It was, it was just like a glorious trip to me, but it had a huge purpose behind it, which was actually securing religious freedom rights for people as there were, there were about 180 religions under attack in different ways. And we were promoting the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And it was a great, all of a sudden that purpose and my other executive training, speaking training, all aligned into this activity. And it was amazing to experience that and feel so at home in that environment. 
Wow. I mean, that's, that's absolutely incredible to just hear the, the various pieces. I love that it's purpose driven now versus, you know, a lot of times people are like, I just want to see what my body can do. You've actually taken it outside of that and said, okay, what message can I connect to something I'm doing? Kind of like Terry Fox did up here in Canada, you know, when he ran for cancer and things of that right. nature. I, I, I really uh, enjoy that con concept. And I, I'm assuming you've taken that course, Confidence and Leadership. I haven't done that. And the reason I, I've, I yeah. can teach that course. Okay. I've sailed across yeah. the North Atlantic. You know, I've flown airplanes. I've, I've, uh, I've rafted down rougher rivers. I've, right. I can, I, I've run teams across Europe for, you know, 2000, 3000 miles, six, wow. eight times. Those things, I look at that, I go, yeah, a lot of people need to do that. But uh, yeah. I, I, I go, it hey, would be I was doing that stuff when I was 14. That's what I'm saying. Oh, my I, goodness. Uh, oh. yeah. <laughs> you know, on top of that, my family had a milk and ice cream business. I grew up driving trucks, picking up milk, delivering milk in stores, working in shops. You know, you had you had to be competent. You had, you know, or you weren't going to you weren't going to be able to survive. So anyway. Uh, OK, so what's next for you? What's the next big adventure? Do you have it in mind? Well, as far as an adventure, uh, you know, I would say like, yeah, I'd like to actually I've got a new business, but I'm right in the middle of starting right now. And yeah. Yeah, I'd love to actually have a nice 65, 70 foot sailboat. And I'd like to have my own plane just so I can get around fast and be able to go go places. But here's the thing. I used to I used to love the freezing rough seas thrill of can I survive it? And I'm mm -hmm. I'm tough. It's interesting. I've gone through that. <laughs> I go, yeah, I, I don't mind long sailing passages and stuff, but I want to make sure that I'm also comfortable now. So as far as the <laughs> adventures go, I uh on that side, I, there's a few places, I've been to 60 countries around the world. And this is another thing I would just say, getting out on those adventures was a huge purpose because I wanted to see the world. And then when I won the world championship, I was invited all over the world. And I had done a lot of traveling with this human rights activities I was doing. So there was great purpose. And the whole, the whole essence of this is I see a lot of people in the quote unquote adventure world and a quite honestly business world, all sorts of stuff that are very self-serving and it's like i want to and my family's big skiers and i some of my couple of my family members they just want to ski 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 all the time and i said i don't how many times can you ski up down the mountain i you know I mean, it's yeah. enjoyable to go out and ski for a week during the year but i don't want to i don't need to ski 12 weeks a year you know it's like that's not the goal of my life because when it's all said and done did you make a difference in somebody else's life did you better a condition? Did you help somebody, you know, achieve something in their life? I think we're as valuable in life as we actually assist others. And through a lot of the, even those runs that I did in Europe, the teams that, that were put together, people didn't think they could do it. And the wins they had and the way their lives were changed. And, and, and I had a hand in that. And sometimes I didn't think I could do it. <laughs> and so you gain this confidence in it. And so really, it's really more to me about about you know leaving a, a positive mark on the world you go through, but at the same to token, being true to your own purposes and passions, and uh, you know your your integrity intact with what you're doing, because you're not chasing some unknown accolade. That once you get it, you're trying to get fulfilled by somebody else's accolade. I I've been right. down that road, and there's not enough <laughs> accolades to to fill that, fill that one. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, you have served as an executive with the 1984 Los Angeles Olympic Organizing Committee. And of course, you might have some insight into what poor Tokyo is going through right now. Um, you've done Nestle and Anheuser-Busch and to completing five new uh, business startups, and you're in the middle of one now. What specific skills are you sought out for? And um, what is your favorite kind of project along those lines? Well, you know, it was interesting. I said so I grew up in this family business, and I thought that's what I was going to do. That was my my entire focus. It's a little bit like having a family farm. And I was the only son. I had five sisters, so it was a large family. As I like to say in my talks, I go, there were six kids in the family. They were all boys except five of them. So, <laughs> um, but um, that was a real life shift because that didn't work out. I won't go into the details. It's just that didn't work out. I was 26 and I moved to, I was out of college for four years trying to make that work. It didn't work. I came to California. I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my life. I didn't have really a game, uh, number, a game plan. And 
I was fortunate enough to get hired. It's a long story, but I was fortunate enough uh, to get hired as an executive in the transportation department for the 84 Olympics, which was a life-changing experience. I spent a couple of years in the Fortune 50 realm and realized that that's not where I thrive. It took me 10 years having gotten out of there to realize that's not where I thrive because I took a lot of losses that I didn't mm -hmm. perform like I felt I should have in that environment. And I look back on it and I go, that is not the type of environment I thrive in. I think the things I'm really sought, sought out for is the fact I'm a good team member. I can handle a lot of varied, we'll say non-stable environments. And that comes from a lot of my adventure background. A lot of people want to come to work and they're in their cubicle and they want to sit down and their computer's in the same place and the coffee cup's right there. I get so bored with that. I like, you know, things change and all of a sudden you have something happen out of the blue, which in a startup, and I've done six turnarounds, you're constantly figuring how can we make this work and coming up with ideas and creating how you can make it work while at the same time keeping the morale of your team high so people aren't getting discouraged and frustrated and infighting. So it's the things I've really been sought out for have been that team component of coming in because I know I'll keep the team morale high and the fact that I'm a solution oriented individual that can be tossed into a number of environments and figure out how to make it work. And not to give this super long answer, one of the things I was so frustrated for when I was working in my family's business, since I was 10 years old, I was working in that, starting to dip ice cream and then free, you know, freezing the ice cream and loading trucks. And hardly ever did I get any training. They just throw you on the job. You know, here, here you go, kid. You know, I first milk rod I ever ran, they just threw me at the truck. They said, drive it down to the store and deliver the milk. I'm like, okay. Mm -hmm. And I used to get so frustrated, nobody's training me, but what in life, and I want to give this as a lesson to anybody listening, that became one of the biggest assets I had in my life because I was used to getting thrown into situations that there wasn't a rule book for, and I had to figure out how to make it work. And I look at so many things I've gotten into, I've been tossed into, you know, just what seems to be like an unsolvable situation so many times and figured out how to put the pieces together and make it work. And I sort of got the training in that, that boot camp at my, in my family's business of just getting tossed into things with no real training. So, uh, by that, I, I go, I can go on about that a lot, but I, and that, the other thing, that's where I thrive. I, mm -hmm. I last thing, like I said, I was, when I was with Nestle, that was a, that was a good experience. I would say it was, it was, how do I say that? It wasn't a good experience, but it was good experience. That's what I was saying. I didn't thrive there at all, but it was really good experience for me to work for a company of that size. And I'm very gracious to the fact that they allowed me, they hired me and they came, they allowed me to come in and work and learn. And it, and it was a, it was a bit of a risk to hire me because where I was, but people saw, let's give this guy a chance and came in. I spent a couple of years there and I learned a tremendous amount, but it wasn't the environment that I, I, that I was going to excel in. And I, I want to just share that to a lot of people probably listening. You have frustrations of the jobs, you have frustrations with friends or people or spouses or whatever. Sometimes it's just not the right environment, the right mix that you're going to excel in. At the same token, you have to be true to yourself and say, am I doing something to screw this up? Because I was, there were plenty of things I was doing to screw it up too. And I had to confront those. So. Right. You know, um, I, I really like your point on, on you know staying active constant change that's what drives me as well and i've been an entrepreneur since i was 19 when i started a software company and then um, i started to become a serial entrepreneur which means i was opening and running my own company simultaneously man that was a lot of work and when i really started to take on more clients where i was like heavily invested into their company you know setting up their marketing and setting up all of the pieces that would help them launch that's where I uh, was able to, uh, you know, get, get that fix on, okay, I don't need to constantly be the, the creator in the beginning, middle and end. I'm just good to come on in, help you launch and take you, you know, get, get you going. And that was enough to um, really constantly be feeding that need for adrenaline change, whatever you, you want to call that, right? All righty. So you are the CEO of TerraX LLC, providing sustainable um, technologies in the agricultural, commercial, industrial, and marine markets. What on earth does that mean? Well, 
it's sustainable technologies. There's a huge area right now. We're trying to figure out how to use our resources better. And a lot of the sustainable systems that are coming out cost more money. They, they it costs, they're less profitable. And we have a portfolio of products. Uh, we have a, like, as an example, we have an irrigation water product that saves 25% in irrigation and gives a 10 to 20% crop yield boost, depending on the crop. We have another product that uh, is used in air conditioning and refrigeration systems that causes them to run more efficiently. So we save 25% in energy in the re air conditioning and re refrigeration. And because it creates a zero surface tension on the metal tubing and the cylinder walls in the compressors, it extends the life of the equipment up to, depending how old it is, but if it's relatively new equipment, we can get twice the life out of the equipment. So there's not the capital expenditure. So we have a portfolio of products like that. And we're geared to the commercial market. A lot of these products are geared towards homeowners and, you know, put this device on your sprinkler or something like that. It's, these are proven products that have been out there for 15 to 20 years. And it's interesting, Stacey, was, uh, in the process, I put a management group together about four years ago when we were looking at different opportunities and we had these small companies we kept being introduced to, and they were not big enough to hire us, mm. but they were great entrepreneurs and great engineers that had created these products. And they'd been selling them locally, or they'd have somebody to sell a few, but they were proven, scientifically proven, tested, you know, industry proven. And so it, we wound up attracting this portfolio. And I, about four months ago, I go, none of these guys can hire us, but we had this, I go, look what we got here. So I, I just went, look, we are great. I have a great management team. I said, we are great at putting the systems together, the marketing, the distribution, the sales, the communication with the customer, the customer service. We're great at that. Let's take these guys. So we just basically said, we're going to market your products for you. It's a, it's a relationship in, uh, what if we say formed in heaven for all of us, they're thrilled to be working with us. We're thrilled to be working with them. And we're just at the launch stage right now. I'm just getting websites up and promo out. I've got a half a dozen products and test with different uh, different industries right now so that we can sh we can prove it, which is one of the things we do. We don't just say, don't take our word for it. Here's a test system. We're going to test it, see that it works. Because a lot of these claims, people go, there's no way. There's no way you can do that. The industry would have done that. But mm. I just want to say, here's what I found in a lot of the products I've worked with. There are great products out there, but the industry won't accept it because it cuts the profits of the industry. Mm -hmm. And when you can extend... We can, as an example, when you can lower the service and repair on refrigeration or air conditioning systems and double the life, the manufacturer is not interested in having the, the, the life of their compressors and units doubled. The service and repair companies aren't interested in having the repairs lowered because it hurts their business. And we have hard data because these industries tried to launch into those industries and the, the, with these products and failed because the industry wouldn't push it. So we go directly to the consumer and that's who benefits from it. And then we get we get a, a more sustainable, more a more econ a more sustainable and more ecological, you know, system to operate and meet a lot of the requirements that the cities and states are mandating that buildings lower their carbon footprint footprint by like twenty five percent and farmers now are getting their water metered out of the out of the wells because there's droughts all over the U S and stuff and so we have a solution to those things so it's very exciting we're really excited about the products again. You know, I was just talking about you're as, you're as successful in life as you help somebody else. And what we're so excited about is that these products will help so many people do better in life and it will help the guys that develop them do better in life because they came up with great products. And it's, it's just that the timing is really great on what we've got put together right now. Well, I love it. I love, of course, the move to sustainability. You know, when you can take something like an air conditioning unit, as you said, and double its life, then that's half the landfill. You know, I mean, it's just, uh, it's so great. And I'm so, I love watching all of the, the videos that are, are showing you more sustainable products that of course, yes, are under the radar. People aren't interested simply because the efficiency uh, of all of it. You know? Just as an example on that, it's like with this air conditioning, uh, it's an additive compound we put in, but mm -hmm. we have rolling blackouts here in California because when it gets hot, the air conditioners are going so fast. So yes, if we can lower that energy consumption by 25%, it could actually solve the rolling blackouts in California. That's the type of impact we can have, but trying to get a product like this implemented takes some real skill into the marketplace where it can actually be utilized at the level it needs to be utilized. And that's, you talk about adventures and challenge, that's the adventure and the challenge yeah. right now is sort of making sure that we actually do 
cross the you know cross the t's dot the i's where we need to and but the thing is there's another slogan i live my life by and that is that good judgment comes from experience and a lot of experience comes from bad judgment mm -hmm. <laughs> and myself and everybody on my team has had a lot of bad judgment in their life and with that we have a lot of experience of knowing what not to do and um, and that's that's why it's so so excited to have the team I have now around me that uh, you know we're very very confident on knowing exactly how we can go about this how to build the organization out and make everything work that we need to so so it's, it's a, this is probably one of the bigger adventures I've been on for what we can do well, as well, far as making an impact in the world yeah yeah it's a huge adventure I I can see you know because you're you're shifting the mindset of society but more importantly you're fighting. The, the upper elements that, that are looking at the, the bottom line versus you know preservation or forwarding of, of humanity, mankind and the planet, you know? Um, and so you got this uh, dichotomy uh, occurring constantly. And, and I can only say that based on what you said earlier about the human rights um, campaign that you went on to confront and, and at that point you were doing um, you know, religious freedoms and rights it's the same type of, of, of um, kind of adventure. And so I, I'm, I'm thrilled that you're on it because um, I have no doubt that you will succeed. Oh, thank you. Yeah, thanks. So we're very, we're very confident and we have so many, I would just, for, for, no, for lack of a better term, we have so many good omens that are happening all the time. It's like every time we run into a barrier mm -hmm. and we feel like, okay, what's gonna happen? We go on the other side of it and we have the whole opportunity has expanded. And so there's so many businesses I've gone into, you hit this barrier to get through it. You had to narrow the business down. You lost opportunity through that barrier. Everything we hit expands. We're going, holy smokes. Okay. Now we got to, you know, put some stuff together from that standpoint. So, but okay. um, I, I love that. Up too. It just, it's so great to have, um, have a team. And that's one of the things I was, you know, I've spoke all over the world. I was, a, I, I did that on my own. I, for 15 years, I was traveling all over. And I had so many opportunities I couldn't take because it was just me. I mean, people go, I want you to come in your business. Can you do some seminars? I said, I'm in Hong Kong next week. I can't do that. Now I have mm -hmm. a team around me. And that's one thing, another thing I want to share is just having a good team around you. Um, you can't do everything yourself. And I was someone who was really good at doing a lot myself, which was probably one of my Achilles heels where I would be, I was so good at doing so many things. I wouldn't assign stuff to others. And so I'm really happy with the um, the three partners I have on this thing because we're sort of the four musketeers, you know, all for one, one for all, and mm. charging ahead on it. So love it, and yeah, team is so important uh, for sure. I'm I'm of the same um, thing. I gotta constantly watch myself on what I want to control and what I should control, right, and what I should let go of when it comes to tasks and things of that nature. So very, uh, very, very cool. Now, I also know that you were the president um, of the Way to Happiness Foundation. And, and so what attracted you to that particular cause? I'm, I'm aware of it. I love and support it as well. Yeah, what, what it is, it's a, it was a book written by L. Ron Hubbard that had, um, he'd studied over 20 cultures and he, he pulled out of those cultures the, the fundamental values or We'll say character and ethics points that mankind across all cultures actually embraces and he wrote a little book called the way to happiness that teaches sort of how to stay on the road so you have a guide path in life to stay on to achieve your own happiness in life because it's the others other people around us that affect us and how do you choose who you walk down the road with and make sure you take the right fork and don't wind up in the ditch and so it's, it's a beautifully written book. It doesn't preach to you. It doesn't make you wrong. It just sort of explains if you make this choice, this is what's going to happen if you make this choice. And I had found that, and there was one chapter in it that changed my life profoundly, which was the last one, which is a chapter called Flourish and Prosper. And it talks about when you get hit with things and you feel like people are trying to push you down and stuff, the best solution is not to attack them, but to go out and flourish and pot, prosper on your own purposes. On that, so I, I had used the book personally in my life just as a little guidebook when I'm when I'm looking for inspiration and trying to get up every morning and feel like I want the twinkle in my eye. Where is it? And through my speaking, I was at a 
productivity conference I'd been asked to host. And so I was hosting this three, three day conference with all these business leaders from around the US and I'm running it right on time. A lot of my Toastmasters training, I'm introducing the speakers, taking breaks, getting people back into the room at the right time. And I'm running this thing and everybody's going, who is this guy running this? Everything is right on time and he's doing it so nicely. Speakers wouldn't want to stop and I have to walk out, put my arm around him going, gotta stop buddy, gotta stop right now. And everybody's <laughs> laughing, it's okay, 10 minute break. Let's be back in here. Then I'd be out in the hall. Two minutes, we're going to start, get back in. And they go, who is this? There were some board members on the Way to Happiness Foundation. They go, who is that guy? We need a new president. And so <laughs> one, of the things that, one of the things I'll just tell people about, the, the fact that I go speak and I am in front of the room has given me so many opportunities because you don't get those opportunities when you sit in the office. And so I got mm -hmm. recruited into that. But it was also, I it came along the same point. I wanted, you want to make a positive impact in the world and having, allowing people to have the, the understanding of how to make proper decisions for themselves, for their own personal happiness and how to be able to get along with others was, I said, I had fought, you know, for human rights on religious freedom for seven years before that. And I saw what was going on and I had, you know, came out of a family situation with the business where there was a lot of those things going on. And you just see that in society all the time. And I had an opportunity to come in. I've done a lot of work in nonprofits, usually as a volunteer, that was a, that was a full-time position. And the foundation was in a real rebuilding phase and they needed someone who could come in and help get it sort of built up. And so uh, I went in there, I was a little over four years as their president to just achieve the things we needed to. So it was, it was a great experience. Well, you know, what I really love about that little book was that was the one story about uh, Los Angeles crime, you know, went down just by the distribution to the uh, the various gangs that, that were in Los Angeles. And then when the book stopped getting distributed, crime went back up and they asked for the return of the book. I mean, it, that just speaks to the simplicity of it. Yeah, it, it, the thing is, everything that happens is a result of an individual's decision. And we're not going to handle things in a country or a world by trying to handle the country or the world. We have to address the individual and we have to give the individual, people have to be, they have to be achieving their own personal purpose in life. They have their own happiness depends on that. And they have to, they have to be accepting of others. And if everybody's telling everybody else what to do, and I do a whole thing on this. I said, I think we could handle all the problems. And it gets back into my speech that I won with was validating the rightness instead of pointing out the wrongness. And I said, you don't get anything done in the world by making other people wrong. And you look at our political, I don't care what country you're in. Uh, the U.S. is horrible, but you, you know, one political party does nothing but make the other political party wrong. We're not going to get anything done moving forward from that standpoint. It's like you've, we've got to come together on what we can do. That What's the other person that do the other person, the other group, what are they doing right is what the question is. And then that builds their self-esteem. Nobody I know, and I know a lot of people, nobody I know enjoys being wrong. <laughs> and that is, you know, across mankind. So that, that book gives somebody, gives uh, an individual their own personal guide to just making their own right decisions, right choices in life so that they, they are ensuring their happiness and they're, in, you know, helping the people be around them. Uh, that are more stable and happier. And the, the examples you give, there's examples all over the world where the book's been distributed, uh, you know, in townships in South Africa to, you know, slums in Philippines to around across the United States and all sorts of the places. And wherever it goes, it sort of calms the area down because people get it and they go, oh, they sort of start to chill out and just go, I can be happy. <laughs> Well, and I love your point on validation as well, you know, because that which you acknowledge, right, or flow power to, you know, comes comes to light, so to speak. So if we're constantly validating the wrongness, then that just keeps accelerating as opposed to what you, you again, also just said about the word, that. The word validate actually comes from the Greek word that means to make stronger. OK, and that's what you're doing. You're making something stronger. So what do you want to make stronger? You want to make the fact that the person's late for work. You want to make that stronger or do you want to make the fact that they answered the phone properly stronger? You know, and so it's like you validate the right things and those get stronger. And then the bad things I watch this over and over again. You start to work on people and validate what's right. They will stop doing the things that irritate you and don't contribute to the group or the business or the family or whatever, just by just by constantly really building up the rightness in them. So. Well, 
Beautiful, spectacular advice. And I, I, Lance, I really want to thank you for being on Reach Millions TV and sharing your amazing story and insights with our followers. So what's the best way our viewers can connect and continue the conversation with you? The simplest thing is my speaking website, which is lancemillerspeaks.com. It's very, my name with the word speaks after it. And you can, I have a weekly video I send out on some speaking tips, leadership tips. Sometimes it's just what I want to talk about. Okay. Mm -hmm. I consider my email list a very personal relationship that I have, but I have a lot of material on there that help people with speaking and especially running the Toastmasters programs, which is what I've done a lot of is I've been very successful in that area. And so that's a, that's an organization I work with, with 16,000 clubs around the world trying to help. Again, where can I make the most impact? If I can get those clubs doing better, they help more people. And so that's one of the things I've focused on in that area, but you can just uh, send me an email via the website. So. Awesome. Well, I am on your email list. I love uh, receiving your stuff. So I definitely uh, recommend that you connect with Lance Miller and to uh, help you reach millions. Be sure to grab my free gifts and best resources from jointracy.com. Stay tuned to this channel for more exciting episodes of Reach Millions TV here on the Live in the Hive broadcast network. And until next time, I'm Tracy Repchuk and here's to your continued success.